Christ. If you would, turn in your copy of God's Word with me to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 17, and we'll be reading verses 24 through 27. Matthew 17, 24 through 27. And if you would, please stand with me as I read God's Word to you this morning. And as we say often, I want to remind you that this is the Word of the living God. This is the word of the living God given for the good of your soul. So hear it as such. When they came to Capernaum, the collectors of the two drachma tax went up to Peter and said, Does your teacher not pay the tax? He said, Yes. And when he came into the house, Jesus spoke to him first, saying, What do you think, Simon? From whom do kings of the earth take toll or tax? From their sons? Or from others? And when he said, From others, Jesus said to him, Then the sons are free. However, not to give offense to them. Go to the sea and cast a hook, and take the first fish that comes up, and when you open its mouth, you will find a shekel. Take that and give it to them for me and for yourself. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God will endure forever. Please be seated. Now, I know as soon as you realize we're going to be talking about taxes today, you were especially excited that you came to church. Well, this is not the tax that you're probably initially thinking of. This sort of tax is not the civil tax that would be paid to a secular government. Uh, Jesus deals with that subject, but not here. The tax that's here is one which we Gentiles, a few couple thousand years removed, might have a hard time understanding at first. But this tax is a temple tax, a temple tax. And this temple tax needs a little bit of explanation for us to understand the thorny question that was given to Jesus here. A lot of times we read a passage like this, and if you're like me, you kind of go, huh, what's that about? What's the point of this, Matthew? Why did you include this here? Well, if we understand some of the history of this temple tax, I believe it'll bring us into the context of the passage and help us see how Jesus is providing for us a tremendous example of the Christian life in this passage. So that temple tax was first given in Exodus chapter 30, verses 11 through 16. And there it was prescribed by God as a tax that would be received during the census. However, as time passed, The tax was required annually of all Jewish males 20 years or older, okay? And that tax was two drachma, which one drachma is about a day's wage. So in other words, two days out of your year, your wages, average wages, would be given over for this temple tax. Now to understand this text, we have to understand the particulars of this tax. And so I want to tell you two purposes for it, okay? Why collect this tax? What is it all about? Well, there's two purposes. First, resources. Second, ransom. This tax was to be used to provide all the resources needful to the ministry of the tabernacle and temple. In other words, where are we going to buy the materials that are needful for us to complete the functions prescribed by God that take place in this temple? Well, this tax was part of how God would resource the work of the temple. But the second is that the tax was also declared by God to be a visible symbol of each man's ransom for his soul. If you have an ESV, you'll read the word atonement for his life. The word there is, I believe, better translated ransom for his soul. Now, that's strong language, right? What does that mean that this tax was a ransom for the soul? There's a lot of ways we could misunderstand that, but again, Context is so important. So let's think about it together. When God gave this command, He gave it at a time in history, in the book of Exodus, when He established the principle of public worship for His people. Of course, you know, if you're familiar with the book of Exodus, it is there that God establishes the Mosaic covenant, giving forth His laws, and then giving the prescription for how the tabernacle, which would be the center of public worship, was to be constructed and built, and all the services that would take place. So God gave this tax at the time when he established the principle of public worship for his people. In addition to the other tithes and offerings prescribed by God, the tax required of each man was the means 
by which the public ministry of the entire nation would be properly resourced and sustained. In other words, this financial giving was the means by which the word of God would go forth in the nation. So let's just stop and ask a question. What would happen to a nation that forsakes the public worship of God? A nation that offers no support to resource the local church. A nation that selfishly clings to its wealth and refuses to give back to God. What would happen to such a nation? Beloved, a nation that forsakes financial giving to the public worship of God is a nation that will suffer greatly. That nation will soon begin to crumble through spiritual decadence, social confusion, and radical moral decline. I know none of this has anything to do with our present time, but of course it's important for us to consider. Can can you see the immediate correlations? And when you think about that phrase, ransom for the soul, when you begin to think about the way this would affect the nation, you can suddenly see that this contribution in fact would be, in a manner of speaking, a ransom for the soul. Because financially supporting the public worship of God is a way of ransoming the souls of that nation because it provides that nation with a clear and resounding proclamation of truth without which no nation can truly thrive. And so you do see God's principle here is an important one. This has to do with some of those foundational, constitution-level truths that governed the people of God of old. And so the question that the tax collectors are asking Peter about Jesus, it's not just a question about finances. Beloved, it is a question about what sort of principles Jesus stands for. It's a question that's far more thorny than we might have first realized. To paraphrase it, it's something like this. Does Jesus your teacher, support the critical work of the temple and all the ministries it is designed by God to fulfill? Does Jesus care about the public worship of God? Or is he the kind of teacher who belittles these sacred things? Well, that's the first part of the situation. And Peter quickly says yes, and you have to almost wonder if Peter actually knew the answer was yes or if he just felt a little pressured to say yes in that moment. We're not told in the text. But Peter quickly moves on. He goes back to the house and he comes to Jesus. And before Peter even gets a word out to relay the situation and what's happened, notice what it says. Jesus spoke to him first, saying, what do you think, Simon? From whom do kings of the earth take toll or tax? From their sons or from others? And when he said from others, Jesus said to him, Then the sons are free. Jesus' question to Peter here is a little parable intended to point out the other side of the situation. We've seen first what this tax meant, how it was perceived by the people. But there's another side we have to look at here, and Jesus brings it out through this question about kings and their sons. You see, the taxes which kings collect are collected from their subjects, not their sons. Why? Because the sons, having a special relationship to their father, the king, are the very ones supported by the taxes that are collected. For the sons to pay taxes is redundant because the money they pay would simply be given right back to them. I want to give you an illustration. This would be like you getting up on a Saturday morning, setting up a garage sale, with all of the stuff you you don't want anymore, and then going out and buying some of your own stuff from yourself. That's redundant. It's already yours. That's a ridiculous transaction to have happen. And that's what Jesus is pointing out here. For the sons to give taxes makes no sense because the sons are the ones who will receive the benefits of those taxes to begin with. And so Jesus comes to his point where he says, therefore, the sons are free. Now, we need to see to go here and say, well, what then is Jesus' point? What is he trying to say here? Well, the king of the temple, this temple tax, the king of the temple is God, God the Father. And this Jesus is his one and only blessed son. And therefore, as the son of the living God, Jesus is free or exempt from the temple tax because Together with the Father and the Spirit, Jesus 
is the very God whom this temple exists to honor and worship. Do you see the tension of the question? In fact, Jesus isn't just the one together with the Father and the Spirit whom this temple exists to honor and worship. Jesus is the one to whom the temporary ministry of the temple always pointed. He is the true and final Lamb of God who has come to take away the sins of the world. And this whole temple and all of its trappings are soon going to be declared by God to be obsolete because Jesus Christ, the Son of God, has finally come to accomplish once and for all everything this temple ever pointed to. So for Jesus to even be asked by the people to pay this tax reveals their spiritual blindness. You see, here is their Messiah standing right before them, the one whom this temple exists to point to and prepare the way for. He's standing right in front of them. He had been abundantly demonstrating his divine wisdom to them by the word of truth that he taught. He had been abundantly confirming the authority of his teaching by the numerous miracles he performed. And he had been abundantly holding forth forgiveness of sins and the saving mercy of God to all who repent and believe in him as Lord. But by asking him to pay the tax, they are humiliating and belittling his dignity and glory. They're treating Jesus as though he is nothing more than their equal. He's just another ordinary Jewish man. By asking Jesus to pay the tax, they're saying, you are just like us. You're not the Messiah. And so here is the problem that Jesus has been, had, has been confronted by. If Jesus pays the tax... He allows his own rights to be trampled as a son, his own reputation to be belittled as the Messiah, and he runs the risk of being wrongly perceived as affirming their false perception about his identity, that he's just an ordinary man. If he pays the tax, that's what he risks. But if he doesn't pay the tax, he runs the risk of giving them the false impression that he does not value the public worship of God or the critical ministries of the temple, or the spiritual well-being of the nation. Do you see where Jesus is? He's stuck. He's stuck because their lack of understanding will make either answer to the question give them the wrong impression about who he is. Think with me for a moment about the context of the Bible. And if you can think about 1 Corinthians chapter 8, you'll remember there Paul talks about another thorny question. Food offered to idols. Can Christians buy it in the marketplace? Can they eat it? And if you remember, Paul says, yes, they can, but they may, maybe should or maybe shouldn't, depending on some factors. Why? Well, let's think about the same thing for a moment. If you eat the food offered to idols, what impression might people get? They might think, well, this person doesn't care that these people are using this for idolatry. But what about if you don't eat the food offered to idols? Well, they might get the impression that you're afraid to because you think idols are real. You think they're a real God. They're a real something you might offend. And you see how you can be stuck and what Jesus is going to do here is give us a key principle. How should Christians think about answering these difficult questions? Not a question of what is right, but a question of how do I help the people around me not get the wrong understanding based on their lack of knowledge about what's really going on? How do I navigate this in the most loving way I can for the bystander who stands either as an unbeliever or as a young and weak believer who does not yet understand these things. And this brings us to the heart of the text, this difficult question of the tax and how Jesus will answer it. And we see his answer in verse 27. And I want to focus on this first part for a few minutes. What does Jesus say? First, he says, the sons are free, however. So the truth is, I don't have to pay this tax. This tax exists to glorify me. 
However, not to give offense to them. Not to give offense to them. I want to show you something. First, to give offense here means to put a stumbling block in the way of another person's belief in the truth. For instance, if somebody knew that I'm a pastor and then they see me, you know, cussing somebody out on the side of the road, that's going to obviously put a stumbling block in someone's way. They're going to go, Christianity's a farce. Look at this guy. He calls himself a pastor. Look how he's living his life. Uh Uh-oh. Maybe we need to take careful attention here, don't we? Because the people in your life know that you are a Christian, and they're watching how you live. And the question that Jesus is wanting us to think about here is, are we putting stumbling blocks in the way of others? Are we doing things that would cause other people to come to wrong conclusions about the Lord? And Jesus says he does not want to do that. So what does he do? Well, before we answer that, we need to think about Jesus in a full picture. Jesus has already shown us throughout this gospel, and he will show us all the more as he continues to make his way to the cross. He has shown us that he is not afraid to offend the world. Jesus does not blush at the truth. Jesus is not shy to declare what is good and right and true. He is not afraid to offend When he is faced with a question of what is true and what is good and what is right, Jesus does not flinch from firmly declaring it, no matter how that truth is perceived by unbelievers. So this isn't a question of truth. This isn't a question of what's morally right. But while Jesus is willing to offend when necessary, Jesus is willing to offend when necessary. He is also eager never to give any unnecessary offense. He is eager to give no unnecessary offense. And you feel that tension as a Christian. If you are to be a faithful follower of Christ, you must offend the world. If you are unoffensive, Jesus calls you a false prophet He says the only people in the world who everybody loves are the people who never tell them the truth they don't want to hear. And if you would follow me, you must be one who's willing to tell the truth, even when that's a hard truth to tell. But there's another side on that balance, isn't there? Just because a truth is hard to declare doesn't mean we should give it in a hard or cold or sharp way. We should add no offense to the gospel. We should add no offense to the truth of Christianity. We should do everything we can not to offend. We should be eager to remove every possibility that we would put a stumbling block in someone's way, even while we are not shying away from holding fast to what is good and true. And so a way we can capture this is like this. What Jesus is teaching us in this text is that he would rather be thought less of by others than do anything which makes others think less of his father. How do we see that in the text? For Jesus to go ahead and pay this tax, he is allowing himself to be perceived as just an ordinary man, just another Jew, an equal, rather than the king of kings who has left his throne to come and save sinners. And Jesus is willing to do that He's willing to be thought less of in order that no one would think less of his father. Jesus would rather give up his own rights than do anything which would make others give up on God. I wonder if you've thought about that before in your own life. How often, especially perhaps in the South, where we can sometimes be very strong about our rights, and we should, It is important that we are good citizens who seek to have a government that maintains our rights. And yet there's a tension there as Christians, isn't there? Where we can be cold and selfish and demanding. And you know what? The worst part is that we might be cold and harsh and demanding about something that's true. But imagine if Jesus had done that here. I'm not paying that tax. I'm the son of God. How dare you ask me to pay that tax? He's right. But he has lost 
his witness to their souls. Do you see the tension? Jesus would rather bear reproach on his own name than do anything to cast reproach on the name of God. One illustration I want to share with you that actually was given just before the service this morning. Will and I were talking and praying together before the service. As you know, Will is a personal trainer, and he brought up this great picture. Hope you don't mind. I'm putting you on the spot here. Imagine Will is somewhere where lots of personal trainers are helping their clients, and Will sees another personal trainer, and that personal trainer is helping their client, but they're helping them in a way that looks like the wrong way. That's the wrong form for that exercise. It doesn't seem right. Will could be feeling like, man, that guy's not a very good trainer. He doesn't know what he's doing, right? He, he, clearly, he's not very well trained, or he doesn't take his job serious. But just a moment, paradigm shift. What if that other trainer is actually the best trainer in the world, but he's willing to look bad because he knows the health history of the client he's working with? He knows their shoulder injuries. He knows their elbow injuries. He knows they can't do it that way yet. And so he looks like he's a fool. He looks like he's not a good trainer. But in fact, what is he doing? Instead of being worried about him looking good and everybody thinking much of him, what is he doing? He's willing to put his name down to make sure that this person whom he's serving has their needs met. That's the principle. That's what Jesus is doing in this text. He is willing to offend when necessary. But our Savior and King is eager never to give any unnecessary offense. And he's willing to look bad himself in order to lift others up and help them. Now, as I thought about how to apply this principle, every time I opened a can, it felt like opening a can of worms that I would not be able to fully address. And the reason for that is this. There are 10,000 ways that this principle can be expressed in the everyday life of a Christian, aren't there? 10,000 ways. And the hardest part, the hardest part is that the right answer in one situation may not be the right answer in the next. Sometimes we need to hold the line firmly with somebody and not budge and say, no, this is what it is. And other times we need to give some slack and bear patiently. And so the question really is, how do we determine which of those we should do? Boy, that's a tough question, isn't it? There's no easy answers. But there are two wrong questions that we are prone to use to try to determine our course of action. Two questions that we're prone to use to answer that that are bad questions. The first one is we ask, well, what are my rights? What am I free to do in this given situation? The second is what will give me the most personal benefit? Both of these questions, dear ones, are wrongheaded because they are self-centered. The focus of these questions is entirely on what we can get for ourselves. And when we make decisions this way, we are still living out of our old nature. We're walking in the flesh, not the spirit. The right question, or at least one way of putting the right question for us to ask is what would Christ-like love have me do in this situation? What would Christ-like love have me do in this situation? And sometimes that means standing our ground in order to help someone see that their perspective is wrong. Sometimes it means giving up our rights and comforts to bear with a weaker brother who still needs time to grow or to bear with an unbeliever whom we hope God may yet save. But in all things... In all things, dear ones, as followers of Jesus Christ, we must seek to uphold this principle, that we would be willing to offend when it is necessary, but that we would be eager never to give any unnecessary offense. And as I alluded to in uh, the, this sermon earlier, the Bible talks a lot more about this subject. If you read 1 Corinthians chapter 8, 9, and 10, Paul gives a lot more treatment and consideration to this difficult tension that Christians are called to live in. The same is true of the latter half of Romans 13, 14, and the beginning of 15. He deals with the weaker brother. He deals with the question of food offered to idols. How do Christians live out their convictions 
in a world that doesn't share their convictions. Their convictions aren't wrong, but they can be misunderstood if Christians aren't thoughtful about how they live them. That's the tension that we are called to live in. And what I want to set before you is this. This remarkable picture that Jesus gives us in this text of walking in attention, of humbling himself instead of asserting his rights, of being willing to give up of himself to lift up another, of doing everything he can to keep himself from creating a stumbling block for others and their belief. That example of boldness and truth and humility in himself is the preeminent example that every Christian is called to follow. But there's one last point I want you to see in this text. Something critical, another piece that keeps us in balance. Because here's the reality. It is easy to abuse this principle. What you could hear me say if your heart wanted to is, well, we can fudge the truth a little bit. We can let go of holiness. We can sin a little here. We can, you know, some commandments aren't that important. That's not what Jesus is teaching. Number one, Jesus broke no commandment by choosing to humble himself in this way. Is it a sin for him to give to the work of the temple? Of course not. Though he was not required to do so by moral command, he was required to do so by the call of love because love would have him do what was best for his neighbor rather than what was just within his rights for himself. And I want you to see one final thing. While Jesus is willing to give up his rights and humble himself to pay the tax, he also made sure that his apostles knew the truth. While Jesus was willing to be misunderstood by the outsider, He's not willing to be misunderstood by the insider. His apostles, he made sure they knew the truth. How? Well, look at the text. Look with me at verse 25. And when he came into the house, Jesus spoke to him when? First, Jesus' omniscience is shown right there. As he's starting this conversation with Peter, he's reminding Peter, Peter, I'm not an ordinary Jew. I'm not your equal. I'm not just another guy. I am the son of the living God. Don't forget, Peter. Though I have clothed myself with flesh, though I have stooped low in humility to save sinners, forget not who I truly am, Peter. And he shows him once more in the text, doesn't he? Because just at the end, when he says not to give them offense. So here's the tension. We're going to stoop low, Peter. We're going to humble ourselves. We're going to give up our rights for the sake of others, Peter. But do you know how I'm going to have you do it? I'm going to have you do it by a miraculous provision of a fish with a coin in its mouth. That's ridiculous. What is Jesus showing? He's reminding Peter, Peter, though I have stooped low, Forget not that I am God. Honor me, Peter, even while these others don't yet know how to honor me as they should. Do you see what he is doing? Our Savior has taught us a tremendous lesson here. And I pray that we as Christians will take that lesson to heart. Look into those passages I mentioned from Romans 13, 14, and 15, 1 Corinthians 8, 9, and 10. Meditate on what this looks like for you in your life as you seek to be willing to offend when necessary, but eager never to give unnecessary offense.